Welcome to the eighth annual Dean Lytle Electrical Engineering Endowed Lecture Series. I am Radha Povindran. I'm the chair of the department. I'm glad you can join us for department's premier annual event featuring internationally renowned researcher in the field of communication and signal processing. I'd like to start by thanking everyone involved in organizing this excellent event. Faculty member Sriram Kannan, Miriam Fazil, Professor Jingneng Huang, and Manas and Kelly Williams. They are two of my advancement team, and they do everything that we don't see how they do. I'd like to present some of the department highlights with so many alumni here, and also my being the new chair. The electrical engine department has hired five new excellent faculty members in the past two years. In fact, the distinguished speaker here helped us to get two of them, although indirectly. We have 50 faculty members, 501 graduate students, and 300, sorry, 501 undergraduates and 300 graduate students. We are ranked 18th in the nation for 2016. Being ranked at the top 20 makes us extremely competitive in terms of being able to recruit excellent faculty and also the graduate students. Thompson Reuters ranked University of Washington as number four in the field of innovation. Among the public universities, University of Washington is ranked number one for innovation by the same organization. UWEE is part of the leaders or leading departments in terms of innovation at University of Washington. In 2014, we reported 49 innovations to startup companies and filed 83 patents. Many of the faculty who are there at the mid-level are very much part of these activities, and they are also part of the organization of the events. With more than 40 research labs, we hold quarterly tours to keep alumni up to date on the cutting edge technology being developed by the faculty and students of the department. Many of them we collaborate with other departments, computer science, statistics, bio, we collaborate very well. If you missed the tour earlier today, I hope you can join us in winter quarter. Professor Payman Arab Sahi is my associate chair for advancement, and Kelly and Manas also can help. If you want to locate them, they will be here. You can talk to them to arrange the visit. Now, the history of the Lytle Lecture Series. The Lytle Lecture Series honors late Professor Dean Lytle, who began his career as an assistant professor at the UW Department of Electrical Engineering in 1958. Lytle's teaching and research focus was in communication, networks, probability, and signal processing. He authored two textbooks, and his consulting work included appointments at Boeing, Honeywell and Bell Telephone. In fact, I met uh, two alum who explained that because of him, one of them was at Honeywell and other one was keeping the accounts of Boeing uh, contracts. I would like to recognize Honeywell, uh, I would like to recognize Lytle's family members in attendance today. His wife, Marilyn Lytle, She's busy writing something. <laughs> Three daughters, Heidi I, Benton I just met, Les Lytle I met uh, just now, and Alison Lytle Perrin we see often at the uh, recitation. Leslie and Alison are both UW alum, as well as Alison's husband Steve Perrin, who I often meet as well. Heidi's husband, Tim Benton, is also here. I just met him. So thanks for joining us, all of you. The <laughs> wonderful. That's excellent news to hear. So if I'm not looking at that side, it's not because I don't want to look at it. The light is straight at my face. So we discussed this point. So I'm, that's why I'm looking down and talking. The Lytle Endowed Lecture Series was made possible through a collective fundraising effort led by Lytle family and Dean PhD student Louis Schaaf. He
he is here and he did a marvelous job on that and Manas can tell you how hard he worked. Together with the help of alumni, friends and colleagues who were positively impacted by the Lytle during his 40 year career at UW, they raised the capital to make this lectureship possible. This is one of the very few endowed lecture series that is at the University of Washington, so we are very thankful about it. Now, introducing Professor David Say, our distinguished speaker today, I'm honored to welcome this year's Lytle lecture spe speaker, Professor David Say. A professor of electrical engineering at Stanford University, Professor Say is a leading researcher in information theory. He was previously on the faculty at the University of California, Berkeley for 19 years. So when we were in the middle of hiring Sri Ram and Balsen, so he was transitioning and the students were going back and forth and you know, I put a lot of pressure on him and some of their advices. They didn't say anything, but they, did, they helped us out. Professor says research interests are in information theory and its application in various fields, including wireless communication, energy, and computational biology. So Bao Sen, who came here, came because of energy. He is actually uh, Professor Say's student, and he was Forbes 30 under 30. We are very happy to have him here. As he came in, he was selected by Forbes as 30 uh, researchers under 30 in the area of energy. Professor Say is also co-author of a graduate textbook, which is very widely used, Fundamentals of Wireless Communication. Professor Say is also the inventor of a version of proportional fair scheduling algorithm used in all third and fourth generation cellular systems. When I say a version, because some of you have looked at the network utility from the Kelly stuff, and different people have different notions, but uh, his contribution grounds it in the wireless, and that has been an enormous transition to Qualcomm from what I hear. Among many honors, Professor Zay has received NSERC Graduate Fellowship from the Government of Canada, an NSF Career Award, the Erlang Prize from Inform Society, numerous Best Paper Awards, and several teaching awards. Please join me in welcoming Professor David Zay. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so can you guys hear me? Okay, so it's really a pleasure to be here at the Lytle Lecture. I looked at the list of the earlier speakers and it was a rather nervous thing, nervous experience. <laughs> so I try my best. Um, okay, so um, the topic today will be on the science of information and um, the science of information is very broad, but I would draw particularly on my experience of my own research in the past uh, two decades on talking to you about two stories in very different fields. One is about pushing bits over the air, and the other one is about working out jigsaw puzzles. Um, so I'll start to talk by giving some background to the birth of the field of the science of information, and then I will elaborate on what this field means, what it does, uh, in terms of these two stories. Okay. So the science of information comes from communication. That is the roots of the field. So communication is a very old field. It started in 1800s with the telegraph, the telephone, the radio, and then the television, okay? So all these are communication systems, and as you can see, they started about almost about 200 years ago. So in the 19, so in the 19, early 1900s, there are these four main communication systems, okay? Now, in terms of the engineering design of these communication systems, what you see is that people view these systems as very different 
systems, and the design is tied to the very specific physical source, okay, and the very specific physical median through which the communication is done. For example, in telephone, it's through the wire. In radio and television, it's over the air, okay? Now, in 1939, something happened, and that something turned the problem emphasis from the physical to the abstract. So let me say a few words about what that means and what happened in 1939. So in 1939, Claude Shannon came onto the scene, okay? So Claude Shannon uh, was a student at MIT. At that point, he just finished his master's thesis. Uh, some people call it the greatest master's thesis ever on connecting the problem of circuit design to Boolean logic, okay? So in the late 1930s, he started thinking about this problem. What problem he started thinking about? Okay, so in 1939, he wrote a letter to his mentor, Venera Bush at MIT. This is 1939. He said the following. Off and on, I've been working on analysis of some of the fundamental properties of general systems for the transmission of intelligence, including telephony, radio, television, and telegraph. And then he says, practically all systems of communication may be thrown into the general form. So here, he started thinking about the problem, not in terms of a specific source or specific medium, but in terms of the general problem of communication for which all of these systems are special cases. Okay, and then he went on drawing a figure. If you have looked at Shannon's work, which I strongly recommend, he almost always have a figure in his paper. And to him, the figure is the most important thing. So here's the figure that he drew. A signal goes through a transmission, becomes another signal, and get received and transformed into another signal. Okay, if you look at this block, from a modern point of view. It's a bit odd, if you think of it as a communication systems, because this picture that he drew here has two aspects. One is deterministic. It is all about transforming signal from one form to another form. Two is very analog. These are all essentially analog signals, okay? Now, so this was 1939 when he started thinking about this problem. So nowadays, you know, we have conference deadlines. Every month there's a new conference. You have to generate some results every month, okay? Fortunately for Shannon, in those cases, there were not like gazillion conferences every year that he has to go to. And his advisor doesn't have to make sure that he has paper to submit every month. So he, takes his, he took his time. So nine years later, finally, the final product came in 1948. And he has another figure, okay? So this is figure one in Shannon's classic paper on the mathematical theory of communication, okay? So you can see that this figure one is now quite, although it looks somewhat similar, but actually it's very different from his figure that he drew on the letter to Venera Bush, okay? So first, he has an explicit circle here, which is the channel, and he has explicit source here, okay? You remember the first figure, there was no channel. It's a bit odd, actually, that figure. But this one it has, and moreover, he, instead of thinking about the problem deterministically, he thinks about it probabilistically. So he thinks about a source as an uncertainty, and a channel as something that adds uncertainty to the signal you transmit. Number two, he elaborates further on what this encoder and decoder is by drawing two boxes, one for compressing the source and one for adding redundancy to communicate over the noisy channel, okay? And in between, he finally introduces a very important concept, which was, at that time, very recent, called bits. And so bits became the common currency of information. So this 
picture is essentially the architecture of, in some sense, the modern information age, where bits connect between the source and the communication. Okay? So this figure one, I believe, is the most important contribution of this paper. Okay? However, there's more than figure one in this paper. There are three theorems in this paper. And these three theorems describe the fundamental limits of communication. So this concept of fundamental limits is the focus of my talk today. So let me start by stating what these three theorems are. Theorem one says that you cannot represent a source by an arbitrary small number of bits. There's a certain number of bits you need to represent the source, and that is described by the entropy rate of the source, H for which he gave a formula for compressing, for representing in terms of the statistics of the source. The theorem two says that you cannot communicate over the channel. There's a limit to how fast you can communicate over the channel. And that rate is called the mutual information across the channel. And that depends on the statistics of the channel. Okay? And number three says that if you want to communicate the source from the beginning to the destination reliably, this will only be hold if and only if the entropy rate is less than the mutual information across the channel. Now, this theorem three seems to be completely obvious from this figure, but actually has some depth, because it is saying that this condition is necessary in a sense that you have this separation is kind of the best that you can do. Any other scheme cannot beat this constraint, okay? So that is the separation result. Okay, so these three theorems and figure one is his contribution to the world, okay? So, 60 years later, what has happened? All communication systems are designed based on the principles of information theory, okay? In 1948, when this paper came out, most people in communication are thinking like what? If you think about how we thought about the problem in 1939, that's essentially an outgrowth of how people thought about communication at that time. So it took him 10 years to break from the mindset of the current age to the final product. It took many other people many more years to accept his point of view. But it has happened. In 19, and 60 years later now, now all the systems are designed based on the principles of information theory. It became a benchmark, okay, for comparing different schemes and different channels, okay? So this notion of benchmark says that it is a limit to how much you can communicate. Now, information theory has made a huge amount of impact. But when you look for impact, what is the ultimate impact? The ultimate impact is Hollywood. So let's see what Hollywood has to say about this issue. Welcome, everyone, to a journey into the nucleus compression suite. Massive functionality, interconnectivity, and the simplicity one has come to expect from the Hooli family. We're making all your files available for lightning-fast download, accessible from any device. All these features will be seamlessly synced to Huli Mail, Huli Search, and the full suite of Huli Computing Power. That's a lot of functionality. Don't worry, he can't come close to our Weissman score. It's like a fancy car with a crappy engine. And now, for the moment of truth. As you will now see, our Weissman score is the best in the history of compression. Exactly the same score as us. 2.89. That is not an error. We are breathing rare air here, operating at the limit for lossless compression. So, the limit of lossless compression. So later on in the Silicon Valley show, he will explain that actually the fundamental limit is 2.9. So he's 0 0.01 away from the fundamental limit. Of course, at some point, in serious, uh, I think in the 10th episode or something, they broke the fundamental limits. Okay, but that's another story. 
So, okay. So, fundamental limits is the focus here. So, when you build physical systems, they're governed by the limits of physical systems. When you build communication systems, information theory governs the limit of communication. So information theory is like the analog of physical law from, from physical systems to building up communication information processing system. As we saw in Silicon Valley, benchmark is a very important role of a theory. It says that no matter what you do, you cannot beat a certain number, and so you can use that number to measure how good you're doing. Okay. However, what I want to emphasize in this talk is that actually the more important role of information theory or the science of information is a constructive one. It suggests new way of doing things. Okay. So, so today I want to tell two stories, two stories on how the theory can be used constructively to come up with new ways of doing things. I would like to emphasize this point because a lot of people think information theory is the mathematical theory. But to me, it is um, as much an engineering theory as in a mathematical theory. In a sense, it is constructive. OK, so here, these two stories are, of course, not completely randomly chosen. They're based on my experience. OK. So first, wireless communication. So wireless communication is one of the hardest research area in the past 20 years, so, and for good reasons. Something interesting happened. Very rarely do we see a technology over the span of two decades goes from essentially 0% penetration in the mid-90s to 100% penetration. Essentially, everybody has a cell phone. Going from low rate voice to high rate data. Okay? So, this is without a doubt one of the greatest engineering feats mankind has known. And powering this increase is engineering. Of course, there are many aspects of engineering that have gotten involved in this. But the one that I want to focus on a little bit here is on the physical layer communication. Okay? So pushing bits over the air is one of the biggest player in this technological feat. And roughly speaking, going from here to here, from second generation to fourth generation, roughly an order of magnitude of one order of magnitude, 10 to 15 fold increase in the spectral efficiency. In other words, the number of bits you can push over the air for the same bandwidth. Okay? So this is quite an amazing number. And how does this happen? OK. So basically what happened during the past 20 years, there's an interesting confluence of engineering and science. So wireless communications, as we know, started in you know, late 1800s and early 1900s. 1901 is the first transatlantic transmission. So wireless has been around for a long, long time. There are a lot of ingenious engineering design, but they're all somewhat ad hoc in the sense that they're based on an engineer's intuition about the problem. Okay? What information theory brought onto the table is the following. Okay? It says, as I said earlier, that every channel has a capacity, the mutual information of that channel. And so therefore, if you apply this theory to the wireless communication problem, it, apply, it essentially tries to understand how to achieve the capacity of wireless channels. And therefore, it provides a very systematic view of the communication problem. So what happens here is that engineering meets science, and something good happens. Okay? New points of view arises. Okay. So the central actor, the central character in this story, in wireless communication, is around 
a fundamental aspect of the wireless communication channel called multipath fading. Okay? So if you transmit from the transmitter to the receiver in a wireless medium, because in a wireless medium, signals go over the place, okay? You get this multipath phenomenon where you have, in addition to line of sight, you also have bounces and uh, objects around you. So this is the multipath phenomenon. And everybody has experienced that by listening to radio in a car, I hope. If people listen to radio in a car anymore, I don't know. <laughs> um, signals goes up and down, up and down can be up to 16, 20 dB, okay? So this has been the central headache, central headache for wireless engineers for 100 years, essentially. It's essentially how to communicate reliably over this really poor physical medium, okay? And the classical view is that this is a really bad situation, it's unreliable, and so if you think about all the engineering designs that has gone to wireless communication systems, from, the, from back from the McConey days, is essentially try to make this channel as much like a pure line of sight channel as po possible. In other words, to try to remove as much as possible the effect of the multipath, okay? And so this is the picture underlying all sort of wireless communication efforts before in information theory was brought onto the table, that is, you try to convert this really bad looking channel to a channel which is as constant as possible. As constant as possible, okay? And the engineering techniques that has gone into trying to make this pro solve this problem is called diversity techniques, okay? Diverse techniques over time, frequency, and space using antennas, averaging over time, transmitting across different frequency bands are all such techniques but they all essentially tries to average the channel and make it as constant as possible, okay? Now, in the mid-1990 19, something, wow, this is so many years ago, I almost forgot. Sad. Something interesting happened is that a paper came out which says the following, okay? If you look at this channel, it's a fading channel. And the traditional way of looking at channel is always to focus on these points, okay? These points are called deep fades, okay? Deep fades means that the channel is really bad because of the destructive interference of the multipath. And so the entire engineer's, engineer's effort, wireless engineer's effort, is to make sure that these points don't occur or occur as rarely as possible by ad additional, using additional diversity techniques. So this is the point of focus, and I would call it the glass half empty points. So this is the view of the channel from the glass half empty point of view. But from the glass half full point of view is the following, is that hey, if you have bad points, then you must have good points as well, right? But the wireless engineer never focused on that. Why? Well, it turns out that if you look at it from an information theory point of view, and just simply ask a very basic question without regard to what the wireless engineer has been thinking about, just ask, what is the capacity of this channel? Well, it turns out that the ultimate capacity of this channel, okay, is that you should, to achieve it, you should transmit opportunistically. Okay, this is a result by Goldsmith and Varaya in 1996, okay, which says that you should transmit opportunistically, that is, you should transmit as much bits as possible when the channel is good and reduce your bits when the channel is very bad, okay? And what multipath fading do for you is that it provides very high peaks to exploit, okay? So it turns out that without multipath fading, you won't have these high peaks at all. And so this picture doesn't exist. However, it turns out that this result is kind of a theoretical result. In the sense that, yes, you could in principle exceed, 
have a high capacity, but only in some very rare, very, very special case, okay? In most cases, when you have a lot of stuff to send, these peaks come too rare to make a big difference. So most of the time, your channel is kind of not near the peak, okay? So this is a small effect. However, it turns out, though, in a wireless situation, you typically do not send to one user. If you're a base station, you'll be simultaneously serving many, many uh, cell phones in your cell. In other words, you have this picture. You have a base station sending to multiple users. And each of these guys will undergo random independent fading. That's a typical situation. It turns out in this case, in this case, the gain from opportunistic communication is vastly bigger than the point-to-point -point case, okay? So this is the phenomenon first observed by Knopp and Humphrey, and we did some related work on this as well, which shows that as you increase the number of users in the system, the capacity of a fading system can be much larger, a factor of more than two larger than a line of sight channel with the same average signal to noise ratio. So here, this result demonstrates very clearly that fading can actually bring you not a bad effect, but actually a good effect, okay? And basically, you transmit to the best user each time, and the point is that as opposed to a single user system, when you have large number of users, there's almost always a user at or near its peak. And so you always have a good channel to send data. And so you never almost use the, st the state where the channel is average or worse, okay? All right, so as uh, the department chair mentioned, uh, this idea was indeed implemented for a real system. So this slide is to show that uh, indeed this theory can make it to practice and now implemented in all 3G and 4G systems. So what's the lesson learned is that from information theory, fading should be exploited rather than uh, avoided, okay? So another example, okay, which is another very important technology for wireless communication is called MIMO, multiple input, multiple output. It turns out in that case, multi-path fading gives you another type of gain, which is a so-called spatial multiplexing gain, where you can send simultaneously over many channels, and that gain cannot be obtained in a line of sight channel. I was gonna explain this a little bit, but then I realized that last year's LIGHTO lecture was Professor Paul Raj, correct? Professor Paul Raj is an expert in MIMO, so whatever he said already, I need not add further. So I will now skip this topic, and I'll bring it to my second story, okay? Okay, so, so let's look forward a little bit. So wireless communication benefited a lot from information theory. Um, it received a lot of attention in the research community. It's not too surprising in the sense that wireless communication benefited a lot from information theory because information theory roots is in communication, okay? So looking forward a little bit, one should ask the question, well, can information theory be useful for other fields as well? So let's ask that question. Let's look at what information theory really is, okay? There are two ways of looking at information theory. The narrow view says that information theory is a bunch of theorems, okay? Theorem one, two, three, in Shannon's paper, 1948, is a bunch of theorems, okay? But it's also, from a broader point of view, it's also a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking to identify fundamental limits in the system, particularly limits of, on information, information bottleneck, okay? Now, that point of view is kind of interesting because an alternative point of view of thinking about com problems is from a computational point of view. How much computation you require to solve a problem? Information focuses on the information rather than the computation, okay? 
So the question is, is this way of thinking also useful for other fields? It has already demonstrated its power in communication. So what happened in communication is basically saying that you can analyze the information bottleneck. The computation typically follows. Is that true in other fields as well? To answer that question, I'll give you a second example of where information theory thinking is useful. So I would like to emphasize the word thinking. Because thinking doesn't mean you can directly transport a theorem from one field, communication, to another field and just apply it there. Or you cannot translate a concept like entropy and directly apply entropy on another field. You have to look at that field, identify the information bottlenecks in the problem, which may be different from field to field, from problem to problem. Okay. All right, so let me spend some time talking about this problem, which I've been spending quite a bit of time thinking about in the past few years, which is DNA sequencing. So DNA sequencing is to look at our human genome. Everybody uh, is defined by the DNA. It is a sequence of alphabet of four letters, A, G, C, T, three billion long, and the sequencing problem is to figure out for an individual or for a species in general or for bacteria the sequence that defines that organism. So we mentioned in wireless communication, it was powered by essentially one thing, which is Moore's law, which makes all these interesting communication schemes that we implemented possible. And we've been writing Moore's Law for 20 years in wireless communication. In parallel to this, in the past 10 years, a little bit shorter than history, but not much shorter, 10, 15 years, there's another revolution going on here called high throughput sequencing. Okay, this is technology to sequence the genome. And the costs have gone down from $100 million in the beginning of the Human Genome Project to just very recently, down to almost $1,000. So I don't know how many orders of magnitude is this. Every year I check, there's a different order of magnitude, it seems. But it's a huge decrease. And Moore's Law is here, and this cost is dropping down faster than Moore's Law. So from an engineering point of view, from an engineer, if there's something that dropped so much faster than Moore's Law, then there should be something interesting that we can contribute there. And this is one motivation of why I'm considering the problem. OK, so let's go into a little bit detail about the technology. OK, how does high throughput sequencing work? And why is it connected to assembling jigsaw puzzle? OK, so I didn't put the word in the title just to lull you here. Although I must say that thought came through my mind. But it has a real reason. So how does shotgun sequencing work? So sequencing the genome, the chemistry of sequencing genome, is much more complicated than just reading the genome from beginning to end, this very long sequence, OK? All technologies nowadays, OK, is based on this idea called shotgun sequencing. OK, so what is shotgun sequencing? You take your three billion long genome, and what it does is it first make many, many copies of the sequence. Then for each copy, it fragments it into many, many short sequences. As a result, you have many, many overlapping short sequences. The length of this sequence may be of the order of 100 to a few thousand, depending on the specific technology, but much shorter than the genome length, which is 3 billion. OK? And the computational problem is to put this back together to get back the actual genome that you're interested in. You're not interested in very short fragments by themselves. You're interested in the whole thing, as much of the whole thing as possible. And so it is a jigsaw puzzle. It is the world's perhaps largest jigsaw puzzle. How large is large? A single sequence experiment, typically, would generate hundreds of millions of reads. This is 100 million. This is 10 to the power 8, we're talking about here, of reads 
generating hundreds of gigabytes of data, okay? So, hey guys, these are the reads, okay? And now, the hundred millions of them, and now you have to put it back together to sequence the genome, okay? And the, the most basic problem here is actually even more difficult than jigsaw puzzle. So jigsaw puzzle, you have a box, right? You look at the picture. So I'll make it more difficult for us and for you is that I, throw, I give you the 100 million pieces and then I throw away the box, okay? Because only nature knows the box. I don't know the box. Okay, so this is a gigantic problem, and this problem has been around for many years, at least since the start of the Human Genome Project, and even a little bit before then. So what is the prevalent point of view on this problem? And here's, I want to draw a line between information and computation. So the prevailing view is based on computational complexity. If you think about it, it's a very natural. So this problem, and like communication, is really a problem focused on computation. You have all these reads, and you need to process them, and then you need to generate an output within, hopefully, a day or two, and not a year or two, okay? So the focus is really on trying to figure out, okay, what is the computational complexity problem? How do I cut down the complexity? Okay? And in fact, it's a combinatorial optimization problem, the most of the formulation. Okay? And that I'll explain a little bit more what that means. But nevertheless, they're typically NP hard and even hard to approximate. Now, if you don't know what NP hard means, it's okay, because NP hard just means very hard. Okay? But it's more interesting than very hard, right? NP hard sounds like you know what you're talking about. Okay? All right. Um, so it's a bit discouraging because usually NP hard is an excuse of saying, I don't know how to do anything properly. So whatever I do, don't hold me accountable for it. And so a lot of the software that's been developed is designed based on ad hoc basis. But the interesting thing is it never addressed the question or very rarely addressed the question of when the computation answer can reconstruct the ground truth. In other words, the information bottleneck is not the focus of this research, okay? So we looked at this problem from an information theory point of view a few years ago, and we asked the question, the information question, which is how much data, in other words, how many pieces of this jigsaw puzzle is needed to reliably reconstruct the genome. Of course, if you have very little data, you cannot reconstruct. The question is how much data do you need and how long the fragments need to be, okay? Now, you may say that, okay, but how about computation? I care about whether I can finish this job in one day, two days. I care about whether I can fit the computation into my RAM of 500 gigabytes. What about those questions? You don't ask, worry about those questions? Well, it turns out that answering this question also helps with answering the other question as a bonus, which I'll explain a little bit why later on. But then let's ask this question. So let's think about it. What is the difficulty of the problem? What is the difficulty of the jigsaw puzzle? Well, any three-year-old kid can tell you the difficulty of a jigsaw puzzle is in how much repeats that jigsaw puzzle has, okay? So this jigsaw puzzle or this jigsaw puzzle, which one do you think is easier? Left or right? Right is easier, right? Because it has many, many different components, so it's quite easy to identify which piece belongs to together in which region. This one has a lot of repeats, but approximately similar, but not quite exactly the same, rather confusing. And so this is a harder problem, and therefore, going back to the notion of fundamental limits, in other words, what is the minimum amount of data needed to assemble is therefore gonna be a function of the repeat statistics of the genome, and it turns out that 
I don't know whether we're lucky or not, the genome has a huge amount of repeats. Nature, evolution, loves repeats. Part of a genome goes from one part to another part. And then that, that part makes copies of each other again. And you get many, many copies, a lot of repeats. So we ask the question, how, much, how the fundamental limits depends on repeat statistics? OK? So this is work done with um, my student, Bressler, and his twin, another Bressler, OK? Two Bresslers. Now, this is kind of curious here. It's kind of coincidence. But remember, this work is on repeats, right? <laughs> Go figure. All right. Together, I'm not a repeat of them. We figure out an approach to characterize the information limit of assembly. So here's our approach. And our approach is a data-driven approach. We figure we live in the world of data science. We better be data-driven. So what does it mean by data-driven approach? Is that we figure out that there are certain relevant repeat statistics that one needs to collect, OK? And for example, this is the repeat statistics. In other words, how the number of repeats of a certain length distribute, OK? This is for a particular genome, the chromosome 19 of the human chromosome 19, OK? From, if you give me, we figure out a way of calculating the fundamental limits given this histogram or something like that. OK, so what does this curve mean? So if you think about the assembly problem, OK, there are two parts to it, two primaries of interest. One is how big the pieces are, the read length. Now, if you have a jigsaw puzzle where each piece is minusculely small, then there's no way you can assemble it. So on the, if the read length is small, then this, ex, this curve says that if you're below this curve, then you cannot assemble it. So we call it the information low bound, OK? On the y-axis, this is a measure of how many reads you sample from the genome, OK? Now, if you sample too few reads, you don't even cover the genome then you cannot reconstruct either, all right? If I only see like a portion of the genome, there's no way I can reconstruct the whole thing. This is what people call the Lander and Waterman coverage, okay? And so this line defines the low bound. And it turns out that this curve tells you the trade-off between these two quantities. And as you can see, the trade-off is very sharp in a sense that there's a key quantity called the critical read length which we can characterize in terms of this re repeat histogram, such that below this number, you cannot reconstruct. And if the read length is slightly above this number, this curve drops down, and then you can reconstruct. So this is the information limit of the assembly problem. In other words, on the left of this, you can assemble. On the right of this, you can assemble. OK. So what does this picture tell me about the computational part of the problem? In other words, what algorithms will be able to reconstruct up to the limit and how efficient they are. So here, I would like to go into a little bit some technical detail, OK? I felt that any talk should have at least five minutes of technical detail. So I will do that right now. Otherwise, you think I just talk and don't do any math. That's no good. OK. So Let's think about the assembly problem now. Uh, we have several approaches to this problem. The approach I'm going to explain to you is joint work with my postdoc, Ilan Shomorani, and Professor Tom Cortade at uh, Berkeley. And here's the picture. So first, how should we think about the assembly problem? Okay. One classic formulation which we would use is called the read overlap graph. OK, so here are five reads, OK? And then I'm going to join these five reads into a graph, OK? So what does an edge mean? An edge means that there is an overlap between this read and this read, OK? Now, then I'm going to write down numbers. What are these numbers, OK? 
So for example, this number is one, what does that mean? That means that if I take this read and I match it with this read, what's the number of symbols of extension I can get? All right, so A, C, G, C, A, if I merge it to this sequence C, G, C, A, how many symbols of extension do I get? One, right? So what's the number of overlap between these two reads? Number of letters of overlap, symbols of overlap? Four. People okay? Four. All right, and so forth. So you form this read overlap graph. If you think about the assembly problem, if you think about jigsaw puzzle, how do I fit pieces together in jigsaw puzzle? You have a certain contour that someone drew for you, right? But here there are reads. So what's the analog of contours in the read assembly problem? Well, you have no contours. You just have a string. Each read is a string, right? However, there are overlaps between the reads. In other words, if you have a read that are nearby, there are overlaps, right? And I'm trying to use the overlap information to piece pieces together. But when there are repeats, then I could piece two pieces together wrongly because they could become from two vastly different regions of the genome. So the whole problem is really a problem of trying to merge reads together that are really physically correct placed. And so you can think of a sequence as a path that, that visits every node at least once, okay? And this path, for example, this is a one legitimate sequence. Okay, so let's read the sequence to make sure we know. A, G, C, G, C, A, T. Here we have T, C, and G, I got confused. Anyway, it's some genome, okay? So that's a sequence. So what's it called? It's called a generalized Hamiltonian path, one that visits every node. And one basic formulation of this problem is to find the shortest such Hamiltonian path, unfortunately, another empty hard problem. So whatever problem you formulate is always empty hard. So that's a theorem in this area. Okay. Now, this looks like a very simple problem. It only has five reads. But do you remember how many reads we have in our typical sequence experiment? Hundreds of millions of reads. So you're dealing with a graph with hundreds of millions of nodes here, okay? And the job is to find a Hamiltonian path, which is almost an impossible task because it's empty hard. The problem here is that you have many, many options at each node going forward. You don't know which path to take. So as an engineer, there is a simple solution if you don't know what to do. Well, you can just do things greedily. Greedily means what? It means that you just take the path with the largest overlap forward and therefore smallest extension. Okay, pick the smallest extension. So I'll just do that. And here it is. Okay, and it turns out that it can reconstruct the ground truth. In this example, this is the ground truth. Oh, I got lucky. Very good. So it seems that greedy should be okay. Okay. Hey, but this is the bad news. What if the true path visits a node three times, or two times? I can't even count. Two times. For example, suppose the true path looks like this. Okay, so what is it? You start here, you come here, you go around, and you go back, and you come back. Suppose this is the true path, the ground truth. A greedy algorithm at this point will pick one of these two paths and therefore may pick the wrong path and therefore disconnect the true sequence. So picking the best path, the smallest extension, the greedy approach, does not always reconstruct the ground truth, okay? What does this correspond to in terms of the sequence? Well, it corresponds to a repeat because this read corresponds to sampling from two regions which are identical. And so in the, in the true sequence, you have to revisit it twice to span the two repeats, okay? 
So greedy approach doesn't work in this case. And actually, we can show in this region where the greedy approach works. It works essentially when each, the ground truth is such that each node is visited exactly once. And that turns out to be only a subset of all the sequences that you can actually sequence. Okay, so it's away from the information lower bound. Okay? So now we ask the question, what about this blue region? Can we assemble this blue region? Because there's a big gap for the, for the chromosome 19. There's a big gap between greedy and the lower bound. So the theory tells us that we should be able to get here. What about the blue area? In the blue area, you may need to visit node at least twice. Now the blue area, at least twice means what? Three times, four times, five times, six times. As the number of times get bigger, your complexity of the problem becomes exponentially growing. It's really bad, right? In particular, let, let us ask, do we really need to visit node greater than two times? Okay, do we really need to visit node greater than two times? What, for example, what if the true path visit node three times? So there's an example of a node that is visited three times in a true path, okay? Now, this corresponds to a triple repeat. In other words, this thing has three copies, okay, and it corresponds to this node, okay? Now, this seems to be a situation, it turns out that we don't have to worry about it. So why don't we have to worry about it? Because in this case, actually, you cannot uniquely reconstruct anyway. Why? Because in this ground truth genome, you are supposed to go around the blue and then go around the red and then come back and finish your sequence, okay? However, the sequence could very well be you go red first and then blue and then turn green. It turns out that both of these paths have exactly the same likelihood and therefore undistinguishable. And therefore, all the points that are that risen no greater than two times are actually already on the left of the information low bound. And so therefore, we only need to visit no at most twice for all these points here. And we develop, develop an algorithm which exploits this fact, that is, the number of extension we need to keep is at most two. And in fact, the two best extensions will work. And we find an algorithm which is complex, is linear in the number of reads. So what we showed here is something interesting. Is that we finally solved the biggest problem, which we can claim for $1 million, called a clay price, which is to prove that NP equals 2P. Because we were able to solve an NP hard problem in linear time. So what's the, what's the, what's the catch? The catch is that we have not solved the NP-hard problem in linear time. We have not solved the Hamiltonian path problem. However, what we have solved is that we are saying basically that the information limit tells us that the bad instances for the computational problem is all on the left-hand side. All I care about is on the right-hand side, which is the feasible ones anyway. And for those, the graph is simple enough that I can solve it in linear time. That's what I mean. Okay? Cool. And then we went on and did a bunch of interesting work with this guy, you may recognize, Shiram, on applying the same concept to RNA assembly, which I don't think I have time to talk about. So let me just conclude, okay? So what's the conclusion? Information theory is about fundamental limits, as the guy in Silicon Valley says the limits, but what I want to emphasize is actually a constructive theory. As we discussed, it suggests new ways of communicating in a wider setting and computing in a DNA assembly problem, okay? It overcomes computationally intractable problems by focusing on tractable instances. So it turns out in a lot of cases, the instances of the problem, which are hard from a computational point of view, are often the ones in which you don't have enough information to solve those problems. When you have enough information to solve this problem, it becomes computationally tractable. 
It's not a theorem, but it does happen in several, in many cases. And tomorrow, in my next talk in colloquium, I'll give another example of that. Okay? It's called a community detection problem. Okay. All right. So that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, can you please use the microphone there? How does the length of the segments that you find in the DNA pieces affect the ability to put them back together? Do you have that as a function? Okay, so the question is, how does the length of the reads affect how you can put the pieces together? Is that right? Yes, but I thought the segments were on the order of 100, so I don't understand that graph from the y-axis, or I mean the x-axis. So the axis is the following, right? If you give me a genome, okay, for which I already know the statistics, then I can estimate this number, okay? which tells me that if you're on the right of this number, on the right of this curve in particular, then you can assemble, okay? So if your read length is 100, like in a particular technology called Illumina, then 100 is less than 2,000 something that you cannot assemble using Illumina. However, if you have another technology, for example, called Pacific Biosciences, PacBio, they have reads of the order of 10,000, then you can assemble. It'll cost you about 100 times as much as Illumina data, but if you want to assemble, you pay 100 times. So is your work saying that it's not going to be possible for strings of length 100 then? To yes. find a green Yes, type it's of impossible. Thing? It's impossible. So this curve is about reconstructing the genome, the entire genome. If you have a length of 100, then all you can ask for is to have some partial reconstruction, okay? And we are thinking about, but we don't have a complete theory on partial reconstruction. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, if not, I'd like to uh, conclude the talk by uh, thanking our speaker, Professor David Shea, for giving a very interesting talk. Um, oh, we can have a round of applause for the speaker. Please.